Professor Schilling, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for taking some time out of your day uh, to talk to us about a super exciting topic, super exciting to me, electric trucks. And thanks for having me. This is, I'm excited about it. Awesome. So a little bit of background information, just a tiny little bit for people like me that um, know very little about this new, well, is it new? Uh, is it a new industry? It, in, my, in my mind, I, I think of it as being in an, its infancy, but I'm not sure that that's the case. So a little bit of a timeline, if you don't mind, very broad brush timeline of where we are in terms of electric trucks. Okay. So, I mean, if you, on the one hand, if you talk to a technophile, they'll say this is very old technology because the very first automobiles that were introduced were electric, of course, but that's not really what we're talking about, right? We're talking about the electrification that has been empowered more recently, mostly by lithium battery technologies because they have much higher specific energy and, and energy density and things like that. Um, and I would say it's totally fair to call this an industry in its infancy, because even though you have companies that have been working on prototypes for a pretty long time, you still have really quite a small market penetration and you're seeing, uh, you're going to see exponential growth, hopefully over the next 10 years. So definitely what we would term an embryonic industry. And we're talking about, just to clarify today, we're talking, we're not talking about the, uh, the, uh, individual trucks, the Tesla uh, Cybertruck, we're talking about the big trucks, as I like to say, the, the ones that carry your groceries, right? They're distributing right. your Amazon Prime purchase. Those, yeah, uh, it's two categories. So not pickup trucks that are for consumers, but delivery trucks, right? Delivery trucks and cargo freight trucks. So that's really, that's actually two classes of trucks, but both in the, on the commercial side. So it's just starting out as, as an industry. And who are the main players right now? In terms of uh, main producers, by far and away, it would be BYD in China. It would be the largest producer of electric trucks. Um, China has really led the way in a lot of electric vehicles. And we don't hear as much about it because they're not included on a lot of the tables of data that we get in U.S. news sources, uh, which is unfortunate because we get a very biased picture of what the electric car industry looks like because of that. Uh, also, uh, BYD also produces a lot of electric buses, so they're the leader in electric buses as well, and they're the number one electric car maker in the world. But definitely taking the lead right now on electric trucks, and then behind them, you know, I don't know what the numbers are because they're changing all the time and they're still relatively small, but you've got companies like Daimler who are building uh, electric trucks. You've also got some new entrants like Nikola and Rivian and... Uh, Lordstown Motors, brand new. And then Tesla is also producing uh, commercial delivery trucks and, and freight trucks. A great segue into my next question, um, barriers to entry. So this is an exciting, right? The future seems to be, and this is a big generalization. I don't have a crystal ball, nobody, but you know, I'm getting the sense the future will be electric. Um, barriers to entry into this it, to me, it sounds like a very capital intense market. <laughs> Definitely, extremely capital intensive. So there's a lot of interesting dynamics going on in this industry because on the one hand, you know in your, you know in your, in your mind that eventually this industry is gonna be huge. And so there's a lot of companies that basically wanna take an option on being the leader in this huge industry. On the other hand, uh, it's gonna take a while before battery costs get us to cost parity uh, between electric vehicles in general and internal combustion vehicles and especially like delivery trucks are diesel a lot of them are diesel for example so getting to cost parity you know we're, we're on the cusp of that but we're not there yet which means you have to be designing and building trucks that are hard to sell right now right that you have to sell with relatively low margin or you're selling them to buyers who have made a really really deep commitment to being environmentally sustainable um, and yet you need economies of scale in this industry, right? You would like to be producing these trucks on a very large scale to be driving costs down and to be getting more reliable production and things like that. And, you know, it's kind of like a, kind of like a, it's not a chicken and egg problem exactly. 
I mean, it is, but it isn't. It's a problem that you want to get to scale in a market that's not yet ready to take this product to scale because of the enabling technologies. And the key enabling technology here is the battery. And so at some point, I hope in this conversation, we talk a little bit about batteries, because I think that's a very exciting place right now that's going to change a lot of industries. So let's talk about that, because my sense is that's where the cost is, right? Are we saying, so I'm going to take what you just said and bottom line it to say, it doesn't seem like electric trucks are affordable yet, unless, as you said, you as a company are making a sustainable, you know, a commitment to sustain sustainability and environment factors and, and reducing your footprint, which there's lots to talk about that as well. But right, right now, uh, dollar for dollar, <laughs> apples to apples, it, the electric car uh, trucks are still not affordable enough to make yeah, so so batteries are still more expensive than, than an internal combustion vehicle. And there's a big debate on what the cost per kilowatt hour has to get down to before we have uh, competitive parity between those two markets. And um, you know, it could be anywhere between $100, $100 per kilowatt hour to $60 per kilowatt hour, which is a pretty big range. But we think that at some point in that range, suddenly uh, electric cars are going to be cost competitive with internal combustion engines and electric trucks and, and all sort of, sorts of electric land vehicles. Uh, we don't know exactly where that is. When it happens, you could see a mass shift because there are a lot of advantages to electric vehicles. Now for trucking though, there are still some other obstacles, not just cost. So obviously range is a, a, a huge issue for trucking, especially if you're doing long haul trucking because right now the range uh, maximum, I think on electric trucks is about 250 miles and that's, for, that's like at the top end and long haul truckers might go longer than that. And the, you know, the last thing in the world you want is for your trucker to have to sit on the side of the road at a charging station for a couple hours recharging the vehicle. And then there's also, there could be specific energy challenges, power challenges, meaning that uh, a freight bearing truck needs a lot of power. And uh, you know, for someone who's only familiar with passenger cars, it, they may not really understand the difference between a battery that has range versus a battery that has power. But power is how much energy you can deliver in a short time period you know, that could actually move something big or move something really fast. And uh, you, you need quite a bit of power uh, in these trucks also. So we, right now, batteries are the bottleneck there. So it's all about the batteries. So who are um, who's working on batteries? I would imagine that's like a lot of money. Again, uh, it just sounds to me like a lot of R and D money is being poured into um, the production and development of of batteries. And in the context of electric trucks, as you mentioned, um, you know the typical. I think from my own research, the typical um, truck driver is on the road for 11 hours, right? They're maximizing their time on the road. So as you said, that would introduce, you know, if they have to stop every, you know, uh, five five hours to recharge for a couple hours, that introduces a whole other logistical issue that is adding a lot of confusion and a lot of cost to the bottom line. Yeah, that's a problem. Definitely a problem. <laughs> um, which is why right now I think electric trucks are mostly used for, for the less than 250 mile deliveries. You know, so it's a constraint right now. Uh, and even then you have to have a charging depot, wherever that, you know, you have to have charging depots where those trucks are gonna end up at night. Um, all right, so let's talk about the batteries a little bit. So batteries, I'm really excited about batteries right now. Uh, so lithium ion, lithium ion batteries, which are the batteries that are powering your computer and are powering the Tesla, that technology has gotten us pretty far. That technology is what enabled us to even start considering all these electrification possibilities. But a lot of people think that that technology may be at the end of its improvement curve. Like we may not be able to get over the next hump with lithium ion batteries. And of course the producers of lithium ion batteries are all the usual suspects. Like you've got the big Korean companies, you've got uh, some Chinese companies, you've got Tesla. So lots of players in the lithium ion battery space. But what I'm pretty excited about are the new development in batteries. So, and that is like an area of like foment and technology technological uncertainty. That's a classic breakthrough innovation scenario where one or maybe a couple of these technologies is going to take hold and then it's going to take off and we're going to see a lot of churn and a lot of technological disruption as everyone switches over to one of these new technologies. And so far the ones, the, the one that I think is a real standout and I've been doing some work with a startup on, on this technology so, so I'm 
you know, I definitely know more about this technology than the others is lithium sulfur. And one of the key advantages, I mean, lithium sulfur has a lot of advantages. One of the first advantages is that sulfur can hold a tremendous number of lithium ions. So it, it can have much higher energy density than a traditional lithium ion battery. And that means you can get longer range. You can also get higher specific energy. It's, a, it's just a better battery. And, and also sulfur is cheap. It's like a byproduct of a lot of industrial processes. And there are places in the world where big mounds of sulfur are just sitting around. So a lot of people would like to see lithium sulfur batteries come to fruition. And the challenge has been that they haven't been, there's a lot of people developing lithium sulfur batteries, but they haven't been very stable and the, the sulfur tends to leach out into the electrolyte. And as a result, uh, they don't cycle for a very long time. And what that means is that you may only be able to charge them a hundred times and then they're dead, they're gone. And of course, if you're going to sell, if you're going to sell batteries, to automakers or to truck makers, you need batteries that can cycle a many, 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 many times or you're not gonna sell them, right? Because that's a huge factor in the cost if you have to replace the battery. So what we'd like to see is batteries cycling, you know, somewhere between 500 times to a thousand times. And the challenge has been finding a way to make sulfur do that. Um, there's a couple of companies. One company that I, I mentioned I'm doing some work with called Zeta Energy is doing exactly that. They think they have a polymerization process that stabilizes the sulfur. And I think they're getting a really large number of cycles in their testing, but it's not been released for public consumption yet. Uh, there's also lithium silicon. And silicon, like sulfur, can also hold a lot more ions than, than, you, would, than you would normally see in, in say, the, the traditional lithium ion battery. And so you can get a much higher, again, specific energy, much higher range, uh, much higher energy density, which means more energy for the weight of the, of the battery. Uh, and the challenge with silicon is that when it gets loaded up with those ions, and I hope this isn't too technical. Um, it, it, I, hope it, I hope this no, is No, you're good breaking your it down really well okay, for me. Okay, good. Yeah. So when the silicon gets filled up with these lithium ions, it swells. It gets bigger. So the problem is that's also a source of instability in a battery, right? If it like swells and then contracts and swells and contracts, what happens is your whole battery can crack up. Mm -hmm. And that's a really, really bad thing. Um, another key thing that's going on in batteries is that like a lot of the lithium sulfur batteries, uh, I think a lot of the technologies right now, at least the one at Zeta, I know for sure, they're getting away from cobalt and manganese and less nickel and stuff like that, which helps make the prices both a lot lower and a lot more stable. And then of course, cobalt is just Cobalt has gotten us into a really bad situation because most of the cobalt in the world is mined by children in the Dominican Republic of Congo. And so it's, it's, it's just not the right thing to do, right? And it's, it's a political lightning rod. So getting away from cobalt um, has been really important for these new battery technologies. But long story short, if these battery technologies prove out, they're going to potentially double the energy density of, of a battery while also reducing its cost dramatically, like significantly reducing the cost. And when that happens, which could happen anytime in the next year or two, we're gonna see a, a complete inflection point, not only in electric trucking, but in all kinds of electrification possibilities, like things at home that you don't currently think of as, as needing to be cordless, it'll suddenly be more practical for them to be cordless. And things that you're used to having to charge every day, like maybe your cell phone, you won't have to charge every day. Uh, so um, then also tons of grid applications here too. If we can deploy these batteries at large scale in utility grids, you can really change the world that way, right? You can reduce the fossil fuels emitted, which reducing reduce the carbon footprint of energy production just in general, and decentralize energy production, which is which is really cool. You reduce your foreign oil reliance. There's just a whole bunch of trickle on effects to having better batteries. Yeah, it sounds like so what this sounds like to me is there's a lot of work to be done on batteries, right? You just outlined all the technical, very technical, and I appreciate that level of detail because it really, you know, to somebody coming into this and not knowing anything, now I get it. There's a lot of opportunity, but there's a lot of work to get there, right? That's yeah. kind of my bottom line. It sounds like a huge opportunity to solve for this, but a lot of work needs to be done to, to find that solve, right? So a lot of R&D, again, a lot of research is being done, I'm sure, in development. Um, 
Yeah, and so it's I, expensive because again, expensive. very capital intensive process to bring a new battery technology to market. It sounds really expensive. So then this puts a, an interesting spin on my next question. If, if, if we stay on the topic of electric trucks and, 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 you know, and batteries, they're the heart of electric trucks because it's everything that will make or break the, the future of electric trucks to make it more practical, more affordable, but really starting with the practical, you know, we can't have them stop after four or five hours on the road because Costco will not be happy with that um, right. or, or, you know, Amazon. So um, what about drones? Because do you see drones in the context of the challenges that uh, electric trucks face today? Do you see drones being a threat? essentially, because now we're talking about drones entering the market, the delivery market. And, you know, to me, the consumer doesn't matter if, if my um, Amazon Prime delivery gets to me, um, for, you know, via an electric truck, or it gets to me via a drone that delivers it. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk about drones, because I think that's also a really exciting area of innovation. Um, and Think about drones as coming in sort of three different main flavors. You've got military drones that are for surveillance and military purposes. You've got uh, delivery drones for, that are being sold for commercial purposes. And then you've got consumer drones, which is where I would also lump in drones for photographers and you know, people are doing real estate development, things like that. Uh, and I'm just gonna talk about delivery drones for the, for the moment, if that's okay with you. Mm -hmm. Now, and drones have even more Achilles heels for electrification than trucks. And the biggest one has to do with weight. So you can put a big heavy battery in a truck. You cannot put a big heavy battery in a drone, which means that energy density, any energy density at truck problem has a drone faces you know many many times over you have to find a way to get energy density meaning the amount of energy you can have per per kilogram has to be incredibly high because you can't you want to get enough energy to power them and also they use a lot of power when they lift up it takes a lot of power to to lift a drone up it's just a, a lot more probably inertia i guess i'm not a physicist but so you need a lot of power and you need to be really light which means that for drones it's going to be harder, much harder for them to get to a place where they can take a lot of market share than for electric delivery vehicles. But, but also the thing is they don't really compete head to head when you look at them closely because first of all, an electric delivery truck, it's probably going to have a range somewhere you know, up to maybe 250 miles, but probably going to do less than that a lot of the time, which is fine because 80% of freight uh, in the U.S., the delivery is less than 250 miles. That's going to account for 80% of the volume anyway, and you can do it with a truck. But then the truck is going to carry hundreds of packages. And trucks also, right now at least, have a driver, which means a truck can pull into, if there's a street where there's a high delivery density, which it could be if they're delivering for Amazon or UPS, and and they can park and the driver can go and deliver, you know, 20 packages on that same block, right? Mm -hmm. Now, a drone generally is only going to take one package at a time. And they're going to take packages right now, usually less than five pounds. So first of all, right away, the truck is going to get all the business. It's over five pounds. The drone can only even consider taking business under five pounds, which means you're, you're really narrowing down the market. But also the drones are only gonna take one package at a time, which means, um, you know, if you're going to a place where the deliveries are really sparse, like you have to deliver a package in on this farm in Iowa and you have to deliver one package on the far side of LA, a drone uh, might be an appropriate choice. But if you're delivering something where there's package density, where you could deliver a hundred packages in a few square blocks, the truck is going to have the advantage even for even with the small packages. Does that make sense? Makes perfect sense. Very interesting. Yep. And yeah, and the other thing is where the drone's key advantage is going to be the, the drone's advantage is going to be in speed because the drone doesn't face traffic. So that's a huge advantage for a drone, right? They just do a crow's line straight to their delivery target and they're not held up by traffic which is which is important and the drone can go places where there are no roads or where the roads are poor which is you know great if you have a crisis in Rwanda and you need to deliver drugs or you need to deliver a specialized part to an offshore drilling rig or, or whatever it is right it's they're 
they're the only choice really for these highly specialized applications. And they're going to completely dominate in that space, also in a space where there's an incredibly high willingness to pay. So if you have a package that's under $5 and you are willing to pay a lot to get it there super, super quick within the hour, drones, drones are going to own that market. And delivery trucks are going to own the market for big packages where you're not willing to pay to get it there within the hour, those things. And then there's going to be a margin in between where you've got some factors that lean towards drones and some factors that lean towards trucks. And that's the space where they're actually going to compete against each other. So you have, let's say, a lightweight package, but it's going to a remote location and the consumer has some willingness to pay to get it there faster do I use a drone or do I use a truck? And whenever I, when, when I think about that, I, I, I always picture that scene at the end of the movie, Castaway. Did you see the movie Castaway? Yes. Yeah. You remember at the end, he's driving the FedEx truck out on this long dirt road to get to her home. Yeah. And I, I always think that is the worst last mile for, for <laughs> FedEx, right? FedEx doesn't actually want to do that delivery because they lose money driving that truck, you know, that long last mile to deliver that little package to that woman out on that, that it's actually like a farm. Um, but then even saying that a drone couldn't do it depending on how far it is. If it's too far, you're gonna start running up against constraints on the range of drones. Now, again, as batteries get better, that some of those constraints shift for the drones. So like as batteries get better, let's say you get a great lithium sulfur battery that has higher energy density, which is gonna give it more range and a lighter weight. You're gonna more, and also more power. You can take a slightly bigger package and you can take it further and and you might ask yourself, does that mean they compete more against trucks? And, and to, my, to my mind, in the long run, it means just the boundary between the market segments shifts. Mm -hmm. So it's going to expand the market a bit for drones, and it's going to contract the market a bit for trucks. And you're still going to have that margin of overlap where you, where you might go with trucks or you might go with drones, depending on other, other things in your circumstances. Yeah, very interesting. I interesting. Great insight. Um, okay, so one last question for today, it might be a two-part question, uh, but what happens now with COVID? We have to ask a COVID question. Is it, um, you know, is it affecting the industry or is it th that research and development is still going on no matter what? Um, and if there is, so this is the second part, if there is any effect from COVID, if there is a slowdown, or even a setback, I'm not sure if a setback would be a realistic scenario, but how long do you think that would last if that's the case? Yeah, that's a loaded question. <laughs> um, so I think there's, there's three things there to talk about. One's quick to talk about, and that is we don't know how, COVID, how long COVID's gonna last, right? And we also don't know, you know, for a while there, the Tesla factories got shut down. Um, when factories have to get shut down, that's a great big problem for everybody across lots of layers of the economy. So we'll just set that aside for a moment because that's sort of unknowable. So I see, you know, I don't think there's a lot of data yet on COVID's impact on the industry, but just looking at the fundamentals of it, if you look at the, the fundamentals of the problem, two big things jump out. And, and you didn't ask me, you didn't tell me these questions in advance. So I'm, you know, I'm going to have to, I'm have to talk on this, the spur of my, uh, my thoughts right now. It's not a well-prepared answer and I could easily make a mistake. But what comes to mind is that on the one hand, delivery is up. Delivery is way up, which right. means that money is going into all the layers of that channel into, you know, money, Amazon's making a lot of money and they're incentivized to buy more trucks and hire more, hire more delivery drivers and invest more in, in their development. You know, they're developing their own drone, for example, they, they have their own drones, their own drone program. Um, and that money trickles through that whole channel. So that could be good in, in the sense that demand is up. That's good for drones and trucks, for electrification of trucks and for drones. On the, the caveat, which is the second part of this, is that the development cycles on these products is really long. So, you know, the development cycle on an electric car, easily five years. I don't know how long it is for trucks. It, it's probably longer. Um, and it's, it could be equally long for drones. So even though you get this jolt where we think, oh, wow, given COVID, wouldn't it be great if we could use drones to move medications around faster? Actually, it's probably a lot less traffic right now, which actually diminishes some of the value proposition of drones. But um, 
but to the degree that we want more deliveries generally, we, we might think, oh, with COVID, we have more deliveries, so wouldn't it be great if we had better drone technology and better truck technology? But the answer is that even if we did, it takes a long time to get there. And all and everybody's working on that already. So I think I'm optimistic that this COVID crisis will pass, hopefully within the next six months. Let's hope, right? <laughs> and if so, my guess is that you won't really see an impact of COVID on the electrification technology, other than the little bump you might see in investment. Because you know, if you look across all kinds of industries, all kinds of companies, R and D spend tends to be a percentage of sales. It's, it's pretty stable, and that's because we don't have budgets that are very elastic in R&D. Like a, a company could see a great opportunity come along, but it generally doesn't have a big pool of money to throw at that opportunity that was just sitting there. It gets allotted a certain amount of money each year to spend on R&D, and that money is a percent of sales. So you're going to see a bump in sales on delivery, and you're going to see a bump in R&D on um as a result of the, those delivery sales. And, and a lot of that could boost electrification. It's actually really interesting. I mean, interesting to me at least, I'm kind of a nerd, but if you look at renewable energy technology, like solar, uh, mostly solar photovoltaic, but also things like wind and geothermal and dams and things like that, and you look historically, there was a huge bump in spend during the 1970s oil crisis, the early 1970s oil crisis, and that effect had a huge enduring impact on, on development in renewable energies because all that spend raised the technological frontier of those technologies and, and you, know, you never back off of that technology frontier. So it just gave a boost. So we could see a COVID boost, although I don't think it's gonna be as big as the oil crisis boost was. Gotcha. So it's, it's, if anything, it might be, there might be a boost. Um, and, and also what I'm getting from this is that, which makes perfect sense to me, it's, it's, it's a slow moving, right, development cycle, as you mentioned, it's not going to have a drastic, just be, by the nature of the industry itself, capital intensive and long development cycles. Um, it's not like, you know, if we talk about the retail space, the retail industry. Now, COVID has a direct effect, right? It's totally right. disturbed them. You know, everybody's living in their PJ. So, you know, <laughs> their whole, <laughs> they have to shift their whole, um, and, and they can develop a new product line or a whole category of yeah. product lines on, on the fly pretty quickly, right? Because they're producing, the yeah, because they're producing derivative innovations, right? They're producing incremental enhancements on products they already have. And so that actually goes back to something a little bit special about this industry is that you have one technology that's pretty mature. Lithium ion is, is a mature technology. We've, we've gotten some improvements on it more than I expected actually, but you know, it's a really well-developed technology already. And then you have these other technologies that are really immature and everybody's already working as fast as they can to, to get them there because everybody knows we need a break breakthrough in battery technology. And there's only so much you can do, right? You, you, yeah, now some money, you throw some money at that problem and things will speed up a bit, right? Because you'll be able to buy capital equipment sooner than you thought. You'll be able to hire engineering firms to come in and solve problems for you. So you can speed it up a bit, but it's not like we had a technology waiting on the shelf that we just needed money to deploy. And you do get that situation sometimes where you've got a great technology, but there's no incentive to commercialize it yet. And then something changes in the environment, some sort of shock. And now you could now you deploy this to new technology rapidly because there's this huge surge in demand or or something like that. But that's not the situation here. You have university teams and government labs and, and national labs and and company labs all trying to develop this big breakthrough innovation and batteries and i would say for the most part money has not been the thing holding it back it's just where you are in the in the technology improvement curve and these curves they look like s's right i'm actually from your direction i'm wait i don't know from your direction i'm <laughs> like this they look like s's because in the beginning you have all the hard problems you don't know how to solve and you're making a lot of mistakes and you don't have good supply channels and you're missing enabling technologies that you need and nobody has any accumulated expertise. And then at some point you're like, 
oh, we're starting to get it. We know what the, what the new technology should look like. We're starting to get a sense of the dumb design and we're starting to get better suppliers and we're starting to get better processes. And then suddenly improvement is increasing really fast. And it could be lots of little incremental improvements, but they're accumulating really rapidly. And you also get piling on of lots of different companies joining the same technology because now it's more clear that it's the dominant design. So it starts improving really, really, really rapidly. And then at some point it starts to taper off again because you've picked all the low hanging fruit you've solved all the easy problems and now you're left with really hard problems and you know and you, you're having trouble eking out improvements and you could spend a lot of money and a lot of time getting really small improvements and certainly in fossil fuels we have been at the top of that curve for a very long time and the only fluctuation you see now is just due to fluctuations in materials costs you're getting no improvement I, I'm pretty much dangerous to ever say no or ever or never, but I'm going to say pretty much no improvement in fossil fuels. You're getting some improvements in lithium ion because again, it's a maturing technology, but you've got these other technologies right at the bottom of the S curve still. So you can throw a lot of money at it and it's going to push it a little faster, but it's probably not going to push it so fast that suddenly we saw crack all these problems um, in a time frame that's COVID relevant. Does that Very make sense? Interesting. So, so the opportunity is those that last category that we're still down at that curve at the bottom. But if we keep, you know, pouring capital into and, and effort into this area, that this natural S curve, yeah, I think it's an S curve. Then yeah. we'll see that rise up of fast incremental changes. That's what you see in the future. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, if you look at a cost breakdown of a lithium ion battery, what you'll see is that all the costs that were around processes and equipment and overhead, the share of those has all come way down. And what you're left with is material costs, like material costs of the cathode are a big deal. And it's really hard to drive material costs down without a fundamental change in technology. In fact, material costs can go up as you start using it, as, you know, as a technology is more in demand, you can get scarcity and material costs can actually go up. Um, what these new technologies will do is shift the material, right? So sulfur is dirt cheap compared to what goes into a lithium ion battery. The cathode will be much, much cheaper. And so that can create a really big cost impact from the get go. And then there will still be improvement as you figure out how to make that sulfur last longer, you know, how to put, you know, tweak the battery format, the battery management system to work with these new batteries. So you'll still get those improvements. This has been a fascinating discussion in a really rapidly developing cutting edge technology and really the future of, you know, electric, the future of vehicles, not just trucks, but all yep. vehicles, I do believe is electric. People are ready for it and it's, yep. and it's coming. I think we as species, you know, whether you're here in the US or in India or anywhere in between, um, you know, people seem to be really, you know, thinking about the environment, which is probably long overdue, but you yep. know, that's where we're going, I think. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your time today. This has been fascinating. Thank you. It's nice, nice meeting you.